Good morning, almost good afternoon. Thank you all very much for coming today. Um, I'm Dr. Kathy Vincent and I'm the Vice Chair for Education. And today we have a special presentation, a special speaker who is here as, as a guest of the UofL LGBT Health Summit, which is at the medical school tomorrow. Hopefully some of you will be able to attend or have already signed up to attend tomorrow. Um, for faculty, remember to sign in to get your CMEs. The number is up here for our talk today. I am really pleased to introduce you to our speaker, uh, Dr. Brian Hurley, who flew in from California to be with us in our lovely Louisville rainy weather. Um, hope it's a, I'm sorry, it's not going to get any better. Tomorrow it's supposed to be rainy too. But Dr. Brian Hurley is an addiction psychiatrist, physician, and is the medical director for substance use related care integration at the LA County Health Agency, which is the second largest public funded health system in, in the country. Another very lucky, fortunate thing for you, uh, public funding. There's a lot that I could tell you about Dr. Hurley. He's very young, but his accomplishments are many. He is certified in addiction medicine uh, by ASAM and the ABPN. He did do an addiction fellowship in addiction psychiatry at NYU, and he did his residency at Mass General and McLean in Boston, where he was chief resident in addiction psychiatry. Recently, he was a UCLA Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar. He graduated from the Keck School of uh, Medicine and the Marshall School of Business at, uh, in California and has his MBA in addition to his doctorate degree. He joined ASAM as a second year medical student as a first year medical student. So for those medical students here, you can get very involved in addiction medicine very early in your medical training. And he's really been involved in ASAM ever since the first year medical year. He was on the membership committee and the finance committee and many, many other committees, which I will let him allude to later on. Uh, he's had many roles in addiction medicine and psychiatry in Massachusetts, in New York, and in California. He, aside from ASAM, uh, Dr. Hurley was the national president of the American Medical Student Association, which is a great accomplishment, a lot of work. It took a year, a whole year of your time. He's been very involved in the uh, American Medical College, uh, lesbian, gay, by bisexual, transgender, and differences of sexual development, patient care advisory committee, ad hoc committee, and on the learning environment, which has to do with curriculum. And he was the GLMA delegate to the AMA, House of Delegates, and served on the board of directors of the GLMA, past chair of the AMA, Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Advisory Committee. He served on the board of directors of the APA, for a period of time uh, during a lot of transition. Currently, for those of you who are interested in addictions and our addiction fellow who is here, um, he is a member of the addiction psychiatry subspecialty exam writing committee. So he's writing all the board questions for the uh, addiction psychiatry board, but he can't talk about that. The afterwards, after our grand rounds today, we're gonna have a round table session with our faculty from one to two, which will be over in the, the outpatient building, and then with the residents from three to four. I'm gonna give Dr. Hurley a little break. Today, though, he will be talking to us about psychiatric practice in the context of sexual and gender diversity. So let me introduce you again to Dr. Hurley. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. So 
I was uh, asked to leave the CME slide up for a minute, and this is um, apparently a form you need to see. So with that, I'm now going to transition over to my slides. Give me a moment. All right, so I'm Brian. I am an addiction psychiatrist. I work for LA County. I'm on faculty at UCLA. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, definitions and concepts around sexual and gender diversity. What does that term mean, sexual and gender diversity? Talk um, a bit about minority stress and trauma. And then, uh, given that this is Psychiatry Grand Rounds, I do feel like it's important to talk about mental health disparities faced by uh, populations of people um, who don't identify as straight or cisgender, uh, which terms I'll define. Uh, we do want to talk just about implications for psychiatric practice. What is are there competencies around LGBT health? What does that look like? And then talk about implications for clinicians and institutions. Uh, take some questions, and we should have you out of here by 1 o'clock. Okay. Every human being has a sex, a gender identity, a gender expression, and a sexual orientation. And this is not specific to people who identify as L, G, B, or T, or lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, but we are all born with a set of chromosomes and a, a set of genitalia. We are all born with, again, an internal sense of who we are uh, as a gendered person that is then expressed in all sorts of ways in how we express our gender in the world, and then we all have a sexual orientation. And each of these actually operates orthogonally to each other. So somebody might be born with a difference of sex development, whose genitalia may be atypical, which has nothing to do necessarily with their gender identity, with the gender that they themselves identify, which may or may not actually impact their gender expression, how they dress or how they hold themselves out in the world. And none of that necessarily has anything to do with who they're attracted to, right, or their sexual practices. So um, I want to introduce the gingerbread person, which looks at these four different orthogonally related concepts. There's gender identity, right? Uh, do you identify as man, woman, somewhere in between, like genderqueer? Uh, gender expression could be masculine, feminine, or so, somewhere in between. Biological sex, male, female, and uh, this particular schematic uses the term intersex as sort of suggesting somewhere in between, and sexual orientation. Um, uh, the, this particular figure uses the term homosexual, heterosexual, and bisexual. Um, this figure is actually incredibly problematic, and I'm going to go into why. Um, but this gives you some overview of sort of the concepts. So I'll talk a little bit about sex. Um, sex actually has some different components. So we think of sex, uh, your biological sex, is usually um, around the development of sex organs and that differentiation happens in utero. Um, you could also look at the presence of chromosomes. Um, I, I don't need to tell you that there are chromosomal abnormalities where uh, there are people whose genitalia development can change even if you are not XX or XY. Um, but th those are generally thought of as the components of sex. And differences of sex development or atypical sex development um, is sometimes thought to refer to people uh, who identify as intersex, but anyway, biological sex. Now, sexual orientation um, refers to sexual attraction or arousal to a particular body type or identity. The relatively common forms of sexual orientation are heterosexuality, homosexuality, and bisexuality. There are other sexual orientations. Um, some of which are listed actually in the DSM, uh, paraphilias, for example, and fetishes are. And then um, sexual orientation identity terms include things like lesbian, gay, bisexual, and straight. So although sexual orientations can be classified typically as heterosexual or homosexual, um, people don't usually them identify as themselves a heterosexual or a homosexual. People usually use the ter identity terms lesbian, gay, bisexual, or straight to, so, um, the, there's dimensions of sexual orientation. So there's your identity, how you label your sexual orientation, w which sort of already introduced lesbian, gay, bisexual, or straight. Um, and there's many more sexual orientations than that, but those are sort of the big four. And then um, your sexual attraction, who you're actually attracted to, and then your sexual behavior. What do you actually do? Um, what are your actual sexual practices? And so there are people who label their sexual orientation as straight who say that they are sexually attracted to people of another gender, but whose sexual behavior might include people of both genders. Or there are people who label themselves as gay, who are sexually attracted to people of the same gender, but who are abstinent, right? They don't, they don't engage in any sexual practices at all. So those are the components of sexual orientation. Um, and then there's gender identity, and that is the experience of one's own gender. And it's not, um, 
sometimes people say, oh, is gender identity, is that a feeling? And I'm like, well, no, feelings tend to be transient. Feelings are things like, you know, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm anxious. Um, but uh, gender identity is generally a deep-seated experience. People, it's their internal sense of who they are. And it uh, can correlate with the sex that somebody's assigned at birth. So you're born, the uh, uh, usually uh, obstetrician looks at the genitalia, says, congratulations, it's a boy or a girl. Typically, those are the two options that are assigned. Um, and, then, uh, and then one's internal sense of gender might concord with that. And people, when that, there's concordance, it's usually called cisgender. People say I'm cisgender. Um, or it can differ from it. And if it's different, usually people identify as transgender. And there's culturally established gender categories, in, at least in our case, man and woman, that usually serve as the basis of the formation of somebody's social identity in relation to other members of society. But you can imagine that if somebody's internal sense of self doesn't comport with the culturally established gender categories, that can um, uh, well, create some challenges for, uh, for people. And that's not necessarily the fault of the person who's having the experience. That, could be uh, related to uh, dogmatic notions around gender. Um, gender identity is not determined by appearance or observed gender expression. So you don't know actually how somebody identifies their gender identity unless you ask necessarily. So to this point, there's been a big push around pronouns. And this is an article in the New York Times Magazine, who's they? So you can use actually a whole number of terms to refer to one's self um, in a gendered way. So I introduced, uh, when I started, I identify as he, him, and his. And there are others um, identify as she, her, and hers. But there are some alternatives, like they, them, and theirs, there are, which we generally think of plural pronouns. Um, but uh, actually, according to Webster's, can now be used as a singular pronoun for people who don't identify as he or she. And then, then there's a whole other variations like a, m, and air, uh, per, per, and purse, uh, v, v, and v. I mean, anyway, uh, I could go on. But if you were to search on Twitter, push for pronouns, you actually see a whole number of variations on, of uh, gender terms that people uh, use to uh, indicate the gender that they want to be referred to. And then gender expression, um, there are people who are gender nonconforming, that is, that don't necessarily match up with the, uh, their internal sense of gender doesn't necessarily comport with um, uh, social expectations, and whose gender performance as the way that they dress or they sort of carry themselves is in some way not conforming with societal standards. And it's an umbrella term to really describe anybody whose gender expression, identity, or roles differ from gender norms um, associated with their assigned birth sex. So this is sort of a schematic illustrating that, that is, you can have a masculine gender identity or feminine gender identity, which may or may not, you know, you then may or may not match up with a masculine gender expression or a feminine gender expression. So if your gender identity is man and you're dressed, and you know, to call myself out, if you're dressed in a suit and a tie like I am, then you would say that I'm sort of a gender conforming man, right? Like I'm, I have a masculine gender identity and my gender expression is sort of culturally masculine. But I could be up here in drag, right? I could be up here dressed like a drag queen in heels, makeup, and, and, and hair. And then I would be sort of a gender non-conforming man. Um, conversely, uh, th that's sort of the same true with drag kings, um, uh, gender non-conforming women versus uh, women who look more sort of stereotypical. So this is the lead singer of a band, Rilo Kiley, who had a video where the, the lead singer... Um, who uh, has uh, been out as identifying as a woman, um, but who says that although I'm a woman, there's a lot of different ways that I express my gender, some ways that are stereotypically feminine and some ways that are stereotypically masculine. This is a shot from one of her music videos to sort of illustrate the point that you can have one gender identity. She's always a woman, um, but her gender expression might differ, um, uh, well, at least in this case, depending on what she's performing. So actually, if we think, uh, to sort of revisit the ginger red person schematic, um, so if we accept actually that um, people can have masculine and feminine components to their gender expression, then actually man and woman are not poles. They're not sort of opposites on a spectrum, but they're really themselves orthogonally related. That, that is, if you think about an axis, you know, the, you have sort of masculinity on one axis, femininity on another axis. So there's people who have, um, their gender identity might include components of womanness and manness, and those aren't actually opposite. Those can sort of go together versus people who are completely, who don't identify as gendered at all. 
And the same thing with gender expression. There's people who are agender, that, that is, um, uh, don't use any sort of gendered signals in how they express themselves, um, versus people who might have very masculine and very feminine expressions. And I think, um, I don't have the picture in this slide, but I think of, I've seen um, drag queens performed uh, where drag, that have like a very long beard and very sort of masculine components to their expression, along with sort of like a dress and a wig, for example. Um, that would be very strong masculine and strong feminine component. Um, and then biological sex could also include elements of maleness and femaleness, depending on sort of genitalia development um, or uh, the presence of chromosomes, uh, specific chromosomes, whether a Y chromosome is present or not or absent. And then um, there are people who are attracted to nobody, sort of asexual people, versus people who are attracted to um, people with male identities or masculine expressions versus women identities and, and women expressions. Um, so if uh, this person were to walk into your office, um, uh, you might wonder, well, what, you know, what pronouns would I use? And I think m many of the people in the room might say, oh, uh, I would use the pronoun she, her, and hers. Just somebody that sort of comports with the stereotypical norm around a gender expression. Now, we don't know without asking, right? But, um, but I think that that's a reaction I oftentimes get. Now, this is Kristen Beck. She's a woman. Um, we know that because she identifies as a woman. Um, but she has been out uh, as the first. She, she used to be a Navy SEAL before she transitioned um, and uh, actually has now left the military, but as sort of a movie and a book and um, ran for Congress, actually, in Maryland. And uh, so, she, so she walks into your office. Actually, you might want to ask, right? Um, now, components of her gender expression are very feminine, the sort of necklace, the dress. Um, but she has been out and saying, I look like a dude in a dress. Like literally she, she says that um, because there are uh, still very masculine elements to the, to the way that she sort of carries herself. And versus if this person walked into your office, this is somebody with sort of elements of either non-gender or both genders, kind of depending on the way you look at it between hairstyle, uh, uh, dress, absence of facial hair, it's not always sort of clear. Um, so if you want to then go back to now not even the gender, the, the uh, gingerbread person, but the gender unicorn, actually there's gender identities that include male, uh, woman, girl, people can identify that way. People can also identify as male, man, and boy, um, but there's actually other genders too. Um, and I know in, uh, in various Native American cultures, people talked about um, there being two-spirit identities, people who um, didn't identify as either man or woman, but identified as somebody with two-spirit. Um, and so there's other genders that are possible depending on your cultural norms. And same thing with gender expression. There's masculine, feminine, but there's many ways that you can express yourself that are really not along those gendered lines. Um, your sex assigned at birth might be male, might be uh, female, might be other, and you could be attracted to men, women, or other genders, and that sexual attraction might be different than who you're romantically attracted to. So um, when I give talks now, I, uh, I mention the gingerbread person because I think it is sort of an easy shorthand of thinking about these components of um, sex and gender, but the gender unicorn is sort of the one that I go with because it uh, is non-binary in the way that it posits uh, masculinity and femininity, and um, I think actually offers a little bit more information about degrees of uh, maleness, femaleness in terms of identity, expression, and attraction. Okay, so just some other terms to be aware of. Uh, the term ally usually refers to cisgender and or um, uh, straight people who affirm sexual and gender diversity. And you may hear the term LGBT, which refers to lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Um, uh, lesbian usually refers to women who uh, their identity is that they're attracted to uh, other women. Gay um, being an umbrella term for any person who identifies an attraction to somebody of uh, a similar gender. Bisexual uh, people who indicate sexual attraction to um, more than one gender, and transgender um, actually not being a sexual orientation term at all, being an identity term related to somebody whose internal sense of gender doesn't comport with the sex that they were assigned at birth. And so that's one term. I've, um, I tried to find the longest term that I could identify that had all of the different terms in it. So there was um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, transgender, intersex, queer, questioning, two-spirit, and allies um, was sort of the longest that I could, I could find. But um, I don't know if you can tell the terminology around all of this is um, not particularly clean. And I'll, I, I put up the term intersex here as a way of identifying that. So there's a group, the Inter Intersex Society of North America, or ISNA. And ISNA um, is there to support people with atypical sexual development 
who um, were, uh, their the sort of mission is that you don't perform medically unnecessary, um, uh, essentially corrective surgeries, unless there's like a clear medical reason to do so. Um, because that has a huge function or a huge impact on um, people's sexual function later on, uh, depending on if some, somebody's sort of atypical uh, genitalia development was um, surgically altered, uh, typically when, when they're an infant. Um, but intersex also is used as an identity term for people who identify as like genderqueer. That is, I don't identify as man or woman, I identify as intersex, which has nothing to do with genitalia development. So that's just one example of a term that doesn't sort of have a clear definition and is used in different ways by different people. So for any clinician in the room, if you have somebody that says, oh, I identify as, you know, queer questioning or intersex, um, I would think about that as like a hyperlink on a website. Like I would want to click on it and be like, so what does that mean? Like, what, like, okay, so you're saying, like, you're saying, you're, like, what, like, what does that mean to you? Um, okay, so I do have a couple slides. So uh, th these are the terms, but one of the questions I'm often asked is, how many LGBT people are there in the country? And LGBT people don't seem to be evenly distributed around the country. DC, for example, has a ton of queer people, um, like 10%. Um, but uh, you have, um, and by the way, queer is a term that has been reclaimed. You can use it to refer to people who, uh, who are not straight or cisgender. Um, and it's not, I'm not using it in a, in a derogatory sense. Um, so, but you see that uh, there are people who self-identify, and this is Gallup data from 2012, who self-identify as being um, slightly greater in concentration along the coasts. Um, but actually in the sort of the center of the country, you see, you know, lots of pockets of blue. Uh, overall, 3.4% of adults are thought to identify as L, G, B, or T. Um, and these numbers actually depend on which poll. So th these are different sort of population-based surveys, and they ask slightly different questions. Do you identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or LGBT? Um, and as I think we've covered, lesbian, gay, and bisexual are sexual orientations. T is gender identity, so those are different. Um, that is, we all have a sexual orientation, and we all have a gender identity, and those are not necessarily the same. Um, and we find that people who identify as LGB or T um, tend to do so in higher rates earlier in their life. Um, and this might be sort of a generational thing. That is, our cultural notions of what it means to have a sexual orientation and to have a gender identity um, uh, may have been more fixed sort of early in our history. We might be seeing um, more sort of, uh, 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 I'll say, cultural broadening of our understandings of uh, sort of culturally appropriate gender and, and sexuality. And so we see higher rates for people in sort of younger generations than in older generations. Um, so uh, uh, given that most of the people that identify as um, LGBT um, are on the, are people whose sexual orientation is not straight, um, there are, you can count then transgender people, and it's thought that 0.6% uh, of adults in the United States actually say, I am transgender. Um, now, I uh, had the chance to look up some articles about Louisville. And so Louisville ranks as the 11th city among major US cities for LGBT populations. And um, well, here you go. So if you then, this is again Gallup data, and this is Gallup data that was published in December of uh, this past year, looking at um, 2012 to 2014 um, uh, surveys. So San Francisco was at the top, um, Portland, Austin, New Orleans, et cetera. And then you, you get to Louisville um, at 4.5%. So uh, U L has spent a ton of work and investment in supporting uh, the LGBT center here. And in fact, one of the reasons I'm here is because of the LGBT center here at UofL. And I think that um, uh, that, that matches, at least in my view, a community need for LGBT responsive programming, education, and care. Um, so I mentioned transgender. There are people who don't identify as transgender, but who are not gender conforming. That is to say, they, they don't identify, um, th their sort of gender performance is not um, sort of matching uh, cultural notions of gender related to their um, uh, their own internal sense of gender. And so um, in a California study that was published uh, last year, um, we looked at uh, there were 20% uh, of youth, this was age 12 to 17, in, um, in a population-based survey between 2015 and 2016, who said, I'm androgynous. Like, uh, I mean, I identify as men, but, I, but I, uh, my gender performance is androgynous, and 6.2% um, that I'm highly gender nonconforming. Um, so this is a pretty high percentage. And if you then look at what are the, um, 
uh, mental health outcomes. And this was a, a measure of severe psychological distress. Um, looking at a validated measure of severe psychological distress, people who are gender, highly gender nonconforming and androgynous um, reported higher rates of uh, severe psychological distress during the past year than people who are gender conforming. So now I wanna pivot into a little bit about minority stress. So it's not that um, having a sexual orientation that might not be straight or having a gender identity that might, might not be cisgender is necessarily itself pathological. In fact, the DSM does not include um, the previous diagnoses of homosexuality or gender identity disorder. So it's not that you can sort of, uh, being gay or being transgender does, is not itself pathological and is not itself um, associated with some internal know, defect or vulnerability. But um, there is this model published by Meyer in 2003 that, um, and this is true for any sort of person who, uh, whose um, race, ethnicity, or identity doesn't comport with um, the majority or sort of dominant culture. But you have sort of circumstances in the environment and a minority status. Could be sexual orientation, could be race, ethnicity, could be gender, um, could be ability level, could be um, religion or religious expression. Uh, and that uh, you get sort of general stressors, but that there are specific minority stress processes, typically around prejudice events, could be discrimination, could be violence, um, could be, um, those are sort of distal processes, proximal processes, including expectations of rejection, concealment, and internalized homophobia, transphobia, um, internalized racism, et cetera, that then um, lead uh, to the experience of increased stress that multiply or intersect with general stressors. And depending on your coping and social support actually impact mental health outcomes. And so your minority identity and the characteristics of minority identity, its prominence, its valence, and its integration, then interact with the stresses in your life to determine whether or not you have mental health outcomes. So here's a kind of a easier schematic to, to look at this. You're exposed to a challenge. They use the word trauma here, and I don't necessarily mean DSM-5 category A trauma for PTSD. What I mean is um, the, the, uh, the experience of a stress or a challenge and that activates your hypothalamic pituitary axis. And depending on whether, you know, do you have vulnerability factors or do you have resilience um, and mediation factors like, and I know that there's some literature supporting that you can do things to affect somebody's adrenergic state in the point of trauma to determine whether or not that traumatic event is coded in the brain um, along like a PTSD framework or acute stress disorder framework or along a resilience framework to determine whether or not you end up with a psychiatric disorder or not. So the hypothalamic pituitary axis has a huge effect on mediating whether or not actually trauma results in um, a, a psychiatric condition. And um, so this uh, was published in, uh, by Kwan in 2013, looking at social support, emotional openness, and hope and optimism, or future orientation, as the key factors that lower your reactivity to prejudice or discrimination that ultimately shape your psychological health. So this is the model that um, through which I think um, we look at the connection between minority stress, that is the social stressors associated with having a minority identity, that could include being LGB or T, um, and whether or not, and, and its effect on your healthcare outcomes. So there's the social ecological model of trauma published by SAMHSA. I'm not gonna read every word on this page other than to say there's individual, interpersonal, community, organizational, societal, cultural, and then sort of time period factors that shape how trauma is distributed and experienced in society. And um, again, this was a, a chapter published in the uh, Implementing Curricular and Institutional Change Guide to Improve Healthcare for Individuals Who Are LGBT, Gender Nonconforming, and Born with a Difference of Sex Development. Um, this is a, a resource for, for educators, but looking at your life stage, um, there are uh, sort of, um, we know that there are emotional traumas associated with verbal harassment um, and likeliness to, to miss school, physical um, uh, traumas associated with physical assaults, um, uh, uh, dating violence, um, uh, childhood physical abuse, and uh, uh, sexual trauma uh, related to sexual abuse um, that increase the risk of 
uh, poor mental health outcomes, but those can be balanced by family acceptance, family connectedness, uh, school safety, adult caring. So we, we sort of think of are there risk factors balanced by resiliency factors to shape whether or not, again, I'm sort of making this point over and over, whether or not any given experience results in um, well, a mental health outcome. Uh, or you know, a poor versus a, a, a healthy mental health outcome. And the same thing is sort of true with adults, verbal harassment, crimes against uh, people or property, uh, hate crimes and physical violence. Um, and then you have sort of a whole set of resiliency factors. I would think including self-acceptance and having an internal locus of control seem to be really important resiliency factors um, just for people in general but certainly for people who identify as LGB or T. And then for older adults, um, looking at phys a lifetime physical violence and instances of emotional uh, or, 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 or psychological abuse. So in 2011, the Institute of Medicine published the Health of LGBT People, um, a building a foundation for better understanding that looked at minority stress, life course, the intersectionality of LGBT identities with all of the other identities around, we all have a race, we all have a socioeconomic status, we all have a language, some of us identify as religious or a-religious and so forth, um, and a social ecology, and said actually what we need to define is a research strategy looking at demographics, social influences, healthcare, intervention research, and transgender specific health needs for a more complete understanding of LGBT health. Uh, this is a point where I'd mention that our national epidemiologic surveys or population-based surveys really do need to include LGBT people in them because when we don't, we're not able to use actionable information to inform this conceptual model. Um, okay, so with that as uh, an explanation for the, uh, the impact of LGBT identities on mental health, I do want to hit on a couple um, what we know about psychiatric illness in LGBT populations. So um, the rates of mental health issues are higher among LGBT populations than in non-LGBT populations. This is positive to be due to minority stress, not some internal deficit leading to poor mental health outcomes. Um, one study found that LGBT groups were two and a half more times likely to have a mental health disorder. This was Cochrane data from, gosh, a while ago. Um, and then several studies show higher rates of depression and GAD, um, MDD among uh, gay men, uh, higher rates of anxiety, mood, and substance use disorders between the ages of 15 and 54, and higher use of mental health services in men and women reporting same-sex partners. Um, gay and bisexual adult men and LGB youth have a significantly increased risk for depression, anxiety, suicide attempts, and substance use disorders, and gay and bisexual men have two or four times increased risk of suicidal ideation compared with straight men um, looking at 12-month intervals and lifetime prevalence. LGB youth are more likely than straight youth to be suicidal. Um, and while LGB youth are twice as likely to have suicidal ideation, they're four times as likely to make a suicide attempt requiring medical attention. LGB individuals have twice the risk of lifetime exposure to traumatic experiences. Um, compared with straight counterparts, young gay men are more likely to report inconsistent condom use and multiple partners. And one third of LGB youth engage in a hazardous weight control behavior such as uh, fasting for more than 24 hours, um, uh, the uncontrolled use of diet pills, or vomiting and using laxatives. What we know about substance use disorders comes from the NISARC, or National Epidemiologic Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions. So this is a population-based survey that didn't just look at sexual orientation, but it looked at sexual orientation um, as measured by attraction, identity, and behavior. So they, they looked at sort of the core components of sexual orientation that found um, odds ratios compared to people who um, didn't identify as a lesbian or bisexual for women, um, significantly higher odds ratios for alcohol use disorder, cannabis use, cannabis use disorder, other substance use and other substance use disorders. Um, and for bisexual women, we saw rates not quite as high as for people who identified as lesbian, but still quite high. Um, for gay men, again, uh, almost three times for alcohol dependence, um, four times for cannabis use, three, uh, the odds ratio was increased three and a half times for other substance use and other um, uh, substance use disorders. And for bisexual men, uh, you sort of saw similar rates of increase. Um, for tobacco use, we know, again, looking at population-based surveys, that identifying as LG or B um, puts your rates of smoking at between one and a half to two and a half times what it is for people who identify as straight. Um, so I've, uh, that's data where we know about sexual orientation. Being transgender in the United States um, actually confers a whole number of risks, including the risks of harassment, physical assault, and sexual violence. 
Um, and uh, being transgender in the United States, uh, actually, if you want to look at intersectionality with race, unemployment rates and people saying I was denied our home and apartment vary considerably depending on what race somebody identifies at. With um, high rates of unemployment and denial of, uh, of housing among African American I'm sorry, American Indian and uh, black uh, communities and people identify as multiracial, although we still sort of see high rates among um, people who identify as Latino as well. Um, so there is, um, published last year, demographic characteristics and health status of um, using a population behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which is really one of the only population-based surveys we have. So I'm just gonna click back a slide. So this data comes from a survey of transgender people. And it was uh, published by the National Center for Transgender Equity. It wasn't a population-based survey. They, they took, um, uh, they, they put out a survey to as many transgender people as they could that would take it. And this was the report they got back. So it's not a population survey. We can't use that survey to know what overall rates are among transgender people in general. We, it is useful for looking at signals of what the experience is of being transgender, but it doesn't necessarily tell us overall rates for transgender people in general. And um, if you look at most of the literature around transgender samples, they're typically convenient samples. They sort of give the survey to who you have access to. And you find super high rates of everything, super high rates of suicidality, super high rates of substance use, super high rates of, you know, um, and uh, so, you know, I sort of sit back and think, well, gosh, are like 80% of people transgender suicidal? That's what some of the surveys suggest, but they're not population-based surveys, so it's not necessarily known. You, you can't necessarily take that survey and be like, oh, well, if you're transgender, gosh, I should put you on a psychiatric hold and we should go right to the psychiatric hospital because, you know, the, the rates of suicidal ideation are super high. Um, but this was one of the first um, you know, behavioral risk factor surveillance survey, so a population-based survey that actually found that transgender people did not differ from cisgender people with respect to the prevalence of chronic diseases, cancer, depressive disorders, or health behaviors such as smoking, binge eating, or wearing a seatbelt. There were higher rates of um, depressive or anxiety symptoms, um, but not necessarily of meeting DSM criteria for depressive uh, disorders. Um, so the point I wanna make here is although we do see higher rates of mood, anxiety, and substance-related conditions among people who identify as LG and B. Um, we know that LGBT people are as capable as anybody of maintaining good mental health. Um, and uh, although, again, the rates are higher, your average LGBT person doesn't necessarily have any of these conditions, right? The rates may be higher, but the rates in the overall population, the majority of people don't have major depressive disorder. The majority of people don't have generalized anxiety disorder. The majority of people don't have substance use disorder. Um, and that is as true in LGBT populations as not. So, um, so when I looked at that transgender survey, I thought that is a story of actually of human resiliency. So we know transgender people experience super high rates of uh, discrimination and of you know, uh, uh, challenge, um, but actually don't necessarily have uh, higher rates of depressive disorders. And that is, to me, uh, uh, a big story about human resiliency. Um, I should mention uh, coming out, uh, I sort of put this in this part of the presentation um, to talk about sort of the process of what, what does it mean to be out. So coming out um, is, uh, and for those of you that celebrate National Coming Out Day in October, um, it references a process where somebody accepts and internalizes their sexual orientation and or gender identity if that sexual orientation or gender identity isn't straight or cisgender. So most people who are straight or cisgender don't even think that there is what do you mean I have a sexual orientation or gender identity? I just, I was born, I was assigned um, male at birth because of my genitalia or the way this sort of appeared when I was born and then I identified as a man, I identified as straight and then sort of went out in the world and never really had to give it a second thought. Um, when uh, one's experience differs from that, right? When their sexual orientation or gender identity is not straight or not cisgender, usually there's a process of coming to recognize that. And that process is referred to as coming out. And coming out actually refers, uh, and there might be some disagreement in this, but I would posit that coming out is starts as an internal process. You need to do that for yourself first. Um, and then you may share this information with others. And that's what people usually think of as the coming out process, as I told somebody, I told my parents, I told my boyfriend, I told my whatever, although you shouldn't have to tell your boyfriend, it should be obvious at that point. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the point is, is that there is a process and it's a lifelong process of um, uh, sort of recognizing and internalizing your own internal sense 
of your orientation and your gender. Uh, and then also then sharing that information with others at various points. I um, bought my husband Valentine's Day flowers and uh, because I was flying to Kentucky and I couldn't be there with him. And, uh, and the, the clerk was like, oh yeah, your wife will like this. And I was like, ah, I get to come out again. And I have yeah, this for my husband. Um, so that's an example of like a lifelong, lifelong, lifelong process. Um, okay, so gender transition. Uh, so, uh, so the coming out process is sort of co uh, coming out that is you're in, uh, internalizing your sort of sense of who you are. Um, but there are people, and there are people, who when they do that around a transgender identity, choose to engage in gender transition. And that, and that gender transition, I have a sort of a slide that goes over it, is the process, the potential process of changing one's gender presentation or sex characteristics to accord with one's sense, uh, internal sense of gender identity. And I have to thank the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition has this great slide that is unfortunately too small to probably see, but I will point out that it starts with a self-awareness and realization of gender identity. And um, uh, for some people, uh, some people then seek assistance from mental health professionals to help um, understand and really conceptualize what a gender transition would look like. Some people, they have an internal sense of that, and that's, that's where they stop. Right? They don't necessarily seek help. Um, but there are people who then want to talk to somebody um, and oftentimes involve a health professional, mental health professional, in order to explore, okay, what is this experience that I'm having around having uh, a gender identity that is transgender and may actually change their appearance or gender expression to coincide with the desired gender. Um, uh, there are people, again, in the course of gender transition that sort of describe this as a process. And um, the uh, MTPC deposits that this happens at some point in somebody's life. And then usually there's a process of typically three to six months of really coming to terms with that. Now, that's, that's a, a, um, a, a positive average. That's not necessarily suggested that that's going to be true for everybody. Everyone sort of goes on their own time frame. And then somebody might then have their experience to change their uh, appearance or gender expression to coincide with their internal sense of gender, and then might come out their friends, families, and colleagues. And for a lot of people, that's where things stop, right? Um, there are people that say, look, I, I don't want to actually change the way that my body functions. I don't want to change my physiology or my anatomy. I don't want any medical procedures. But I just want to live my life as somebody uh, who, where my external ex gender expression matches my internal sense of gender. But for others, actually, um, uh, there are people that then say, well, look, actually, I do want to have sec secondary sexual characteristics. I want to have curves, and I want my body to look a certain way. And you can use hormones to help with that. Um, or lack of, like, there, there are uh, trans men that want beards, right? And uh, testosterone is a pretty effective way of generating that. So um, generally speaking, uh, for some people, they may want to get hormone therapy in order to be able to achieve secondary sexual characteristics um, that where their bodies then comport with their internal sense of gender. Um, and the uh, uh, World Professional Association for Transgender Health has a standards of care document that goes through what you should do um, and the, sort of the order in which one ought to do things in order to uh, ensure a successful transition. So oftentimes, uh, starting somebody in hormone therapy, you want to be sure that if you're going to do something that is potentially irreversible and testosterone kind of goes one way, like your voice, like when you take testosterone, like you, you will notice changes um, that, that can be irreversible. You want to be sure that somebody has what's called mental health clearance. And what mental health clearance looks like is you want to be sure that somebody's internal sense of gender is not itself distorted by another psychiatric condition. Um, so you just want to screen for um, is this somebody with an uh, sort of um, borderline personality disorder or other types of personality disorders that might affect um, uh, one's uh, uh, sense of gender. Um, does somebody have any other what we used to call access one conditions like a mood disorder or a anxiety disorder that might shape the way that they see their um, their gender? You want to be sure that those things are addressed, right? That, that, that you're not necessarily treating somebody's personality disorder or mood disorder or anxiety disorder with hormone therapy, that it's being treated with appropriate psychiatric treatments. Um, and then, but it, when those uh, psychiatric conditions can affect one's sense of gender are addressed, and when it's clear that one has a solidified internal sort of gender that um, is uh, different than the gender that they were assigned at birth, then usually you get a referral letter and you can start hormone therapy. 
Um, and then uh, usually, you know, assistance from medical, uh, uh, medical health professional to that's necessary to facilitate that. And then there are people that want gender affirming surgery, right? They, they want actually surgical changes to their sex characteristics. And, um, uh, and oftentimes those aren't covered by insurance and oftentimes you need to accumulate finances to undergo many multiple possible surgical uh, procedures to obtain a body that coincides with the uh, desired gender. So this is kind of a, a graph or a timeline going over what um, the typical gender transition is for people who are transgender, which people can kind of, you, you might just happen internally, might be external, might involve hormones, might involve um, a, a surgical procedure or procedures. So this is the WPATH document, the standards of care for the health of transsexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming people. Um, these used to be called the Harry Benjamin standards. The last ones were published uh, seven years ago. Um, the U of L, uh, Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, actually says we follow the, um, uh, the standards of care and the guidelines of the diagnosis and treatment for gender nonconforming and transgender youth that, um, that says, look, uh, having a gender identity that is incongruent when one's assigned sex at birth um, is not a diagnosable condition, um, but uh, that if there's dysphoria related to that, um, then uh, that then becomes a, a treatable condition. And the treatment for gender dysphoria is generally gender affirming medical treatments. Um, if you look at the transition process, one's internal, internal sort of discord, um, which is referred to here as interpersonal trauma, um, is highest at the point of recognizing a transgender identity and internalizing it. But where somebody's um, gender performance and the way that they carry themselves in their life is different from that. Um, and as you go through a social, potentially medical transition process, that interpersonal discord goes down. Interpersonally, however, um, other people reacting and responding to somebody's transition actually seems to go up as you begin the transition process and sort of peak at the point you know, um, where somebody uh, is sort of, um, uh, in, sort of peaks during this apex of the coming out process. And so there's all sorts of instances where people are misgendered, that is they're not referred to as their, um, uh, as their internal or uh, their desired gender. Um, there's all sort of bathroom bills and related traumas. And so those are all things that sort of in, impact uh, interpersonal trauma, which people navigate. But as people navigate them and begin to solidify and reconcile their external and potentially um, uh, physical gender markers with their internal sense of gender, um, you generally see interpersonal trauma go down. And, um, and so the, gen the transition process is thought to overall actually be hugely helpful for people's mental health because their interpersonal trauma goes down and ultimately over the course of the transition, um, uh, the trauma they experience from the world also goes down. And there's a whole set of protective factors that impact somebody's transition process. So I mentioned gender dysphoria, um, gender and gender nonconforming, transgender and gender nonconforming individuals are not inherently disordered. Gender identity disorder is not a psychiatric condition any longer. Um, the distress of gender dysphoria is diagnosable. And this is the, uh, so the DSM has a whole set of criteria for it. I'm not gonna read every word other than to say, it's characterized by marked incongruence between one's experienced and expressed gender and their assigned gender for at least six months as manifested by various measures of distress. Um, so uh, in that context, uh, the uh, Association of American Medical Colleges published this um, curricular and institutional guide to um, guide changes to improve healthcare for individuals who are LGBT, gender nonconforming, and we initially wanted and or born with a difference of sex development, but the editor said and or is weird to put in a title. So it says or born with a difference of sex development. But the truth is there are people who may identify as LG or B and or might be gender nonconforming and or might have a difference of sex development because those are again are all orthogonal components to the human experience. Um, I was on the writing committee for this. It was published in 2014 and you can download it online. Um, so I'm gonna transition a little bit to talk about competency. So there is the WMC and Bob Englander at the WMC has published um, a set of domains for health professionals um, and physicians. And so they looked at what are things, what are the entrusted professional activities, the EPAs, 
that we expect physicians and other health professionals to be able to do. Um, and they looked at all of these uh, competency lists. What do we expect people to do? And what, what competencies do they need in order to perform them? Um, and derived a reference list of general physician competencies that consisted of 58 competencies in eight domains. So for those of you that work in graduate medical education, the ACGME has six domains, but the WMC added two more. So these are three of them. Patient care, you have to be able to deliver patient care. That is, recognize the unique health risks and challenges encountered by individuals, and as well as their resources, and tailor health messages and counseling to boost resilience and reduce high-risk behaviors, right? Um, that's one component of patient care. This is one competency. There's a whole number of other competencies related to patient care. But another domain is knowledge for practice. Um, to understand and explain how stages of physical and identity development across the lifespan affect um, populations and how healthcare needs and clinical practice are impacted by these processes. Um, Practice-based learning. Identify strengths, deficiencies, and limits in one's knowledge and expertise. Um, but wait, there's more. So those, those are three. Um, interpersonal and communication skills, professionalism, and systems-based practice. That rounds out the six ACGME competencies um, around communicate effectively with patients, families, and the public, demonstrate accountability to patient society and the profession, and coordinate patient care with the healthcare system. Those would be all competencies necessary for physician practice. Um, and although these competencies were developed kind of by and for physicians, I do think that they're relevant to all health professionals. So for any non-physicians in the room, I'm not trying to say that you know, physicians own these in any particular way. And then the two additional ones that were added were interprofessional collaboration and personal and professional development. Um, that is, we expect physicians to be able to work with other health professionals to establish and maintain a climate of mutual respect, dignity, diversity, and ethical, ethical integrity, and practice flexibility, maturity, and adjusting to change with the capacity to alter um, one's behavior. So um, uh, these are examples of the competencies related to LGBT health that we came up with, and it's actually a whole like it's you know 60 or so competencies specific to LGBT health practice or to, to health practice uh, related to LGBT people um, that we expect people to know. So I'm not going to go through them all other than to say like we, we expect that physicians should be able to recognize the unique health risks and challenges often encountered by LGBT people, right? And as well as the resources available to LGBT people and tailor health messages and counseling efforts to boost resilience for LGBT people, right? That would be an example of a patient care competency. Um, and so we expect to provide positive sexual health messages, to mentally prepare oneself before taking sexual histories, to prevent inappropriate expressions of alarm or undue fascination with less common forms of sexual uh, attraction, and to help patients who feel isolated by sexual orientation, um, gender, or differences of sex development to locate peer groups. Those are all competencies that we expect um, to come out of the, the patient care domain. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of uh, modalities that you can use to teach these things, um, but this is sort of one example of uh, uh, LGBT relevant competencies, and I have to thank the WMC committee for this slide. Um, same thing for knowledge of practice. We want to um, affect the trajectory of gender nonconforming people. Um, uh, we want to know that the pubertal advancement in gender dysphoric adolescence predicts future transgender identity, and that LGBT elders are more likely to, to feel isolated from families and may or may not have offspring to tend to their needs. That impacts knowledge for practice. Um, uh, in the patient uh, practice-based learning and improvement domain, parents of a newborn son born with uh, atypical genitalia may feel pressure to follow recommendations of surgery from specific physicians. A lesbian woman may defer to a physician's recommendation not to get a pap smear because she's not engaging with sex with men. This is not an appropriate practice, by the way. Um, and patients who are experiencing shame may not disclose aspects of their identity or behavior to their doctor. That's all sort of relevant to practice-based learning and improvement. So I'm not going to go through all of these um, um, I, uh, if you want to read more of these, I encourage you to come uh, to the document, uh, the WMC's uh, Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, Sex Development document, because it has a whole bunch of specific competencies. But I do want to, so I'm going to click through this. Um, but what's the bottom line? The bottom line from my vantage point is that the clinicians, good clinicians, should be reasonably free of homophobia, transphobia, and heterosexism. And I would make the same comment around ableism, racism, um, uh, religious prejudice, et cetera. Uh, we expect the good clinicians to have positive regards for patients, uh, uh, generally a positive regard for their patients. 
and to welcome and promote openness about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression in the therapeutic setting, and to be familiar with many of the issues commonly faced by LGBT people. To me, this is the floor. This is what I would expect anybody um, graduating from any health professional program to be able to do these things. And the competencies developed by the WMC take specific elements of this and follow them down you know, a, a certain chain along the, the um, uh, competency framework. But you know, that's a very long list. And I think, uh, frankly, it would be boring if I would just review that whole list with everybody today. So this is what I think of as the takeaway, is we expect clinicians to be capable of doing these things. Um, now, uh, there is a role, though, for specialty LGBT care. And specialty, what do I mean by that, like these LGBT clinics? So I expect, if I refer a patient to any number of clinics, that I expect the clinic to be capable of doing these things, or the clinicians in that clinic to be able to do them. But LGBT expertise in program settings can be really helpful for people whose um, mental health condition is directly related to coming out. I don't necessarily expect people who've not ever participated in coming out to necessarily provide expert guidance to somebody that, whose struggle is with coming out. Um, when people, when patients are not comfortable with discussing their personal lives outside of a protected setting, LGBT programs can be really helpful to provide that protected setting. When there's people for whom their inner conflict about their sexual orientation or gender identity is a significant factor impacting their mental health, or trauma victims um, whose traumatic event was related to homophobia or transphobia specifically, like a hate crime, or people for whom uh, pathological activities such as compulsive sex associated with methamphetamine use um, that can be difficult to discuss in a general population setting, this, there's a clear role for LGBT health programs for, these, for this kind of phenomenon from my perspective. That said, um, if you are a lesbian woman who's been out for a long time and who is not struggling with coming out and who is pretty comfortable discussing the fact that she's a lesbian, and there's, not, there's really not that much of an issue, and she happens to have alcohol use disorder, I don't necessarily know that I need to send her to like an LGBT center for alcohol use disorder. Um, because she, the, the actual treatment for alcohol use disorder works the same in her as it does in everybody else. Counseling, support, and medications, right? Um, so the core ingredients of the way that you would do treatment aren't necessarily different for LGBT people, but the context in which those treatments are provided can be different. So if that context seems to be needed related to these factors, I think that there, there is a clear role for LGBT health centers. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone who's LGBT needs to go to an LGBT health center. I don't think that everybody, uh, for example, that um, might identify uh, with a certain religion needs to go to a religiously identified health center or you know, uh, like a racially segregated health center. Like I, I don't think about that. I don't think that that makes sense. But it does make sense um, uh, when the patient actually is struggling with things around where an LGBT health center that consolidates expertise can be helpful. Um, so that's sort of my implications for individual clinicians. I do want to talk a bit about systems. So systems have an overt or explicit curriculum. This was sort of developed thinking about medical schools, but really all systems have an overt or explicit way of doing things. And everything has an infrastructure, and there's something called the hidden curriculum. So the hidden curriculum are the implicit set of norms, values, and regulations within the process of training that students are exposed to, or in the process of practice that clinicians are exposed to, that um, individuals are expected to assume and embrace in order to function effectively in a professional role. Sometimes, and they're not written, but you'll know if you don't do them. Um, so I imagine if a medical student uh, who typically is, wears a short white coat, that is sort of like, the, like that's part of uh, what I call the medical student expression. Um, if a medical student suddenly walked in wearing a like uh, huge, like full body fur coat, and that became their coat, that would be um, uh, noticed, and that would be reacted to. And uh, nowhere is it written, thou shall not wear a fur coat, right? Like that's not written anywhere, but that is part of like the hidden curriculum is you sort of know you're not supposed to do that, just as an example. And so there are areas of the hidden curriculum that actually um, are uh, entirely comport with a formal or intentional message. That is, the hidden curriculum can be very helpful at shaping 
how you're supposed to do things and do them appropriately. But sometimes you get hidden curricula messages that contradict or, uh, uh, or intention with what we expect um, people to actually do. So a classic example of this is uh, in first and second year medical school, you learn how to take a complete sexual history, just as an example. You learn how to take a complete sexual history as part of, of a H&P. But then you go into clinical practice and uh, you actually see that people are misgendered, that a sexual history is not taken, or when it's taken, it's taken in a you know, sort of an abbreviated way. Um, and you're, you're sort of left wondering, like, well, how am I actually supposed to behave? I'm supposed to, to take a sexual history like I learned to in first and second year medical school, or am I supposed to misgender people and, and, um, and uh, sort of do an abbreviated version that, that doesn't seem to actually capture what's really going on? So that's an example where you get a message that could contradict or undermine an important formal message. Um, so uh, what I think of uh, around in, uh, assessing institutions' abilities in order to be effective for LGBT patients are, are you educating people? Are there protections against mistreatment? That is sort of um, uh, policies related to uh, 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 protections uh, against uh, homophobia, heterosexism, transphobia, et cetera. Um, is there leadership and commitment to actually moving forward in LGBT programming? Is there a culture of equality? And um, what is the pa uh, patient care environment to actually support LGBT people? Those are the domains that I think are important to institutional assessments. But unfortunately, um, there is no one like instrument to assess all of those things. So the WIMC has the Kermit um, tool, which is I think now folded into MedEd Portal, and uh, has a set of a graduate student and um, organization of uh, student. So there's the um, student questionnaires, the graduating student questionnaire, and the OSR, the Organization of Student Representatives, also has a questionnaire. Um, the WMC Graduate Questionnaire. The HRC, uh, Human Rights Campaign Foundation, has the Healthcare Equality Index that actually looks at what are the core components of effective institutional policy um, related to LGBT protections for patients and for workers in uh, health organizations. And then uh, there's the Campus Pride Index, Outlist, Safe Zone programs, LGBT-related events that can help be markers showing institutional commitment. Um, so what, what I'd say is if you're an institution looking to promote um, LGBT equality, to identify a champion, engage in dialogue, have a lot of patience, have a lot of patience, um, in building the productive and professional uh, collaborations that are needed and listen to the patient's voices. That is, healthcare is here to serve people um, and oftentimes patients are in the best position of giving us feedback when supporting uh, uh, institutional changes. So um, when an organization like U of L has made significant strides to then go and talk about it, right? To publish it in journals and present it at conference. And no, no successful change is too small to disseminate. Um, uh, interprofessional teams provide uh, healthcare. So uh, linking, you know, nurses, dentists, psychologists, physicians, you know, um, social workers, et cetera, um, in a training environment um, where there are, you know, assessments and institutional support is critical uh, as part of interprofessional applications of, uh, of LGBT health equality. So with that, I think I have 10 minutes for questions. Um, if you're too, um, uh, how do I put this? Uh, if you don't want to ask your question out loud, um, this is my email address and I would be happy to get back to you. So with that, what questions do you have? Uh, the question was, I'm a geriatric psychiatrist and many of my patients uh, grew up in an area with more culturally restrictive notions around gender and sexuality. How do I cultivate um, openness among the patients in sort of talking about these issues? I think that um, there's a whole number of specific steps that um, clinics is or are recommended for clinics. And I, I didn't sort of review them all here, but doing things like um, 
on patient you know, questionnaires, offering people an option to identify their sexual orientation, uh, their sexual orientation identity, you know, to identify as gay, straight, or other, um, to identify uh, their gender identity so you don't just click male or female but have sort of either gender colon and a write-in or um, you have another column where people can, can write that in. But I don't know actually that like questionnaires um, are the answer, particularly for people who uh, have grown up in a generation where things were particularly fixed and binary. Um, so what I might do is be curious with my patients. I might say, um, just as you said, uh, uh, people in your generation grew up in a time with really fixed notions of gender and sexuality, and I want to encourage my patients to be open. I'm wondering if there's anything that you know that that you would feel comfortable to discuss. Understanding that I'm open to hearing whatever you'd have to say, and simply having that sort of signaling that openness um, might might be helpful. Um, I think uh, you know uh, I, uh, whenever I meet somebody, um, I do I go through the process of of asking. Um, you know, I, I try not to use anyone, I, I don't use pronouns with anybody until I know what their pronouns are. And I don't, um, in, in my, I have a private practice in LA in addition to sort of my county work, so I don't have a form that people fill out, I meet them first. And so what I'll do is I'll say, um, uh, you know, everyone has a gender identity, has pronouns that they want to use, my pronouns are he him, and his, he, him, and his, how would you like me to refer you to today? And that, just asking permission, um, how would you like me to refer to you? creates a window for people to be open about sort of how they identify. Um, and then uh, I'll say, you know, some people uh, are sexually active with men, some people are sexually active with women, some people are sexually active with people who don't identify as men or women, and some people are sexually active with none of the above. How would you describe your sexual activity would be sort of an example of asking about sexual behavior. Um, and then sometimes I'll ask, is, you know, is there a particular term that you use to identify yourself? For example, some people identify as straight, some people identify as gay. Have you come to any, you know, notions about what fits for you? But like really broad, open-ended questions where I'm setting a context of openness to be able to discuss those things, I found to be helpful. Now, um, I have given that same advice uh, to people in uh, like family doctors working in rural settings. They're like, I can never say that to my patients. You know, they, it's, it's not authentic to me. And then I would say, well, do something that's authentic for you um, in order to signal your openness. W the, the words that I just gave are what works for me in my practice, but I think that um, signaling an openness and a curiosity around understanding that not everybody is straight and cisgender goes a long way. Does that answer your question? The comment was um, the average age in your practice is uh, 80 and that um, people came from a different time, but that when you inquire and you're open, you learn a whole lot of information about people's experience that you would not necessarily know based on their, uh, their gender expression in the office. The question is, um, for people who uh, come out as LG or B, or who come out as transgender, um, uh, what are the reasons why somebody would come out? Is it a biological reason? Is it an environmental reason? Do we know any, anything from the scientific literature? So um, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, there was, uh, during the decade of the brain, there was a significant attention paid to, is there a gay gene, right? Can we, can we identify some locus on some 
chromosome somewhere for what makes somebody gay. And you could say the same thing about transgender, although at the time they were really interested in sexual orientation. Um, and the scientists at the time um, posited there were all kinds of conceptual models and theories. And you know, the thing with genetics is you're working with a huge data set, so you can find um, uh, one in 20 times something's going to be statistically significant because that's our threshold for significance. So you know, there were there were signals and sort of things that suggested, but nothing that really panned out. Um, the the idea that um, you're going to find a genetic marker for being gay the way that you would find a genetic marker for cystic fibrosis or other types of sort of genetically linked diseases implies that being gay is sort of a disease state, right? And the idea that um, uh, what is probably sort of a natural variation in uh, human sexuality is reducible to one gene or one sort of combination of genes um, is likely reductionistic. Um, we do know that in uh, human beings, we, have, we all have genetics, and those genes are expressed in an environment. So people with, can, may have genetically sort of identic, identical genetic genomes, but might have very different actual phenotypic biologies depending on what was their life, you know, what was their life like in utero and what, how, how did they develop? Did they develop in a stressful environment with inadequate sort of food protection or resources? Did they uh, evolve or did they develop in a secure environment with adequate, you know, access to resources and so forth? Um, so I, I think that the idea is, is that genetics or environment, I mean, genes are expressed in an environment and you can have very different phenotypes from the same genes depending on the kind of environment that you have. Um, so this all goes to say that there is nothing in the scientific literature around there being some biological or um, uh, environmental cause to having uh, an identity that is L, G, B, or T. Um, and these things um, seem to, people tend to discover these things about themselves um, without any particular locus or reason why. There are theories, I mean, there's all kinds of people that posit theories, but nothing supported in the scientific literature as a cause. And I would say that we don't necessarily ask about sort of like causes of why there are some people that, you know, uh, like certain types of foods or other types of foods, we sort of accept that that's a normal part of the human experience. I would say that that's the way that I've come to look at sexuality is there's, you know, people have an internal sense of self and an internal sense of what they desire and what, you know, the way that they sort of comport themselves in the world. And that's actually, from my perspective, a normal part of the human experience. And there's not anything sort of, there's unlike, we're unlikely to find a set of genes that are somehow variant as why that is somehow abnormal. Does, it, does that make sense? I, uh, one more question, I think I'm at time. The, um, uh, the, the statistically significant difference was compared to gender conforming people. I don't think the sample would be big enough to have detected, I mean, let me go back to the slide. Do, do, do. So, um, yeah, I, uh, what I would say is I would chalk that difference up probably to statistical error rather than saying that there is some um, inherent signal. So I don't think the 3% difference here, right, um, between 15 and 18, is statistically significant that you can say, um, because this was this sample was of 12 to 17 year olds, so they are already working with a relatively, I mean, 17% of the sample is a large number of people, but I don't think that that 17% is large enough to be able to detect this difference statistically. So I don't think that these two are statistically significantly different from each other, such that we would be able to read into somehow there being some, uh, some factor related to psychological stress associated with being androgynous versus hi highly gender nonconforming. Um, so I would chalk that up to you know statistical error, which is happens when you do population based surveys. No, yeah, compared to compared to that, okay. yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much for your time and attention, and uh, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate your participation. Thank you so much.